we know that you're about to announce your budget soon, right? October 7th, I think, has been brought forward. Give us a sense of what your priority areas are and what key issues are you trying to address? Well, first of all, um, it's going to be a challenging year, 2023. Uh, budget, of course, is on the 7th of October. Um, we are facing uh, various uh, challenges even now, even today. I mean, as, as I said just today, we are looking at uh, the strengthening of the dollar, slowing down the uh, global economy. But for Malaysia, uh, we are on track for this year, uh, 2022. Um, GDP growth will be uh, perhaps or even higher than what we had anticipated it to be. Uh, so How much higher? Our official forecast uh, is 6.3 to 7.3%. I think we will uh, probably surpass that. We've seen the second quarter growth uh, at 8.9% and third quarter looks like even stronger than that. Um, so we should be on track to to be the, uh, the, the forecast that we have uh, anticipated earlier. Um, that the new number will be announced, uh, unfortunately, as in the, on the 7th of October. I can't say it today. Um, but we both, also importantly, is infl infl inflation. Inflation in Malaysia is now around 2.8% for the first seven months. Our monetary policy remains accommodative, uh, although the Bank Nagara has just increased OPR, our rate by 25 basis points to 2.5%. It's still lower than what it was before the crisis, which was around 3 to 3.25%. So Malaysia this year uh, will be on track. Um, subsidies has helped. Uh, subsidies going to be uh, in the region of 80 billion ringgit, as close to 20 billion US dollars. is the highest ever uh, subsidy uh, done in, in, in a budget or in a year. Um, and this has helped maintain that uh, inflationary rate. And, and unemployment also has gone down. Unemployment today, uh, last week we announced unemployment is now back to our natural rate of unemployment at around 3.7% from its peak of 5.3%. Um, so this year, um, we are fortunate to see where we are today. Of course, uh, Malaysia being a net exporter of commodities have helped, right? Uh, where oil prices is, on oil prices, uh, exports, we are part of an integral part of the supply chain for uh, manufacturing uh, of E&E, &E, for example, that you know, accounts close to 40% of our exports. So that has, has helped uh, Malaysia uh, this year. But next year, as you have uh, correctly, or well, many are anticipating it's gonna be a tougher year. Uh, so the, for the budget next year, it's gonna be focusing on four uh, pillars. We're going to focus on people, it's going to be focusing on uh, business, economy and the government. Uh, and it's going to focus also uh, on three key areas. One is to maintain the momentum uh, of economic uh, growth, uh, which we have achieved this year. It's going to be more difficult. We we'll probably have to we'll see a moderation in GDP growth for Malaysia. Secondly, is to make sure that the growth is sustainable and inclusive. And thirdly, it's about being fiscal responsible, uh, responsibly, fisc uh, sorry, fisc about fiscal responsibility. Uh, that's why we're also focusing on our new Fiscal Responsibility Act. Uh, at this point, uh, Minister Shrimuliani, I want to bring you into the conversation. We talked about uh, the risk of inflation. And of course, there are murmurings out there that Indonesia's inflation could be looking at 7 to 8%. I mean, what are your own thoughts on that? And going forward, even uh, Governor Wajio has said that 4%, keeping it below 4 will be a challenge. He likened it to trying to bend over backwards like an acrobat just to get to that level. Well, um, the pressure from uh, both food and energy prices is actually quite uh, severe uh, from uh, many uh, different country in this case, including Indonesia. So if you look at the Indonesia inflation uh, last month, uh, August is 4.9, going down a little bit to 4.6%. Deflation usually happened in September. But if you look at the component of the inflation, it's mainly coming from the volatile food, which is uh, we can explain, for example, from wheat and many other uh, uh, cooking oil, which is also have a very high correlation with the geopolitical situation. So if you look at the underlying inflation, which is related to the core inflation, which is demand driven, it's actually still at 3%. So the question from the policy point of view, how we are going to respond to the uh, to the inflation, which is mainly coming from the supply disruption. Uh, this morning, for example, uh, President, this is uh, have already many time now discussing with uh, all governor as well as the municipal uh, mayor uh, of the cities in order for us to be able to go through through the detail where the pressure of this price is coming from, especially for the food prices, which is, I think, can be prevented. 
While on energy price, as you know that uh, last week, we've already announced the adjustment increase uh, at the average of 30% of the subsidized uh, uh, fuel, fossil fuel, which of course it will release a little bit of pressure on the budget. Uh, but on the other hand, this is also will uh, increase the administered price inflation coming from this adjustment. So we try to make sure that first, if the issue is coming from the supply side, we are going to address on the supply side. Of course, Bank Indonesia, as the authority on the monetary side, they also have to establish a policy which is uh, going to be able to manage the inflation expectation as well as the stability of uh, rupiah in this case. As mentioned earlier uh, by Tegusafrul, that we are all facing with a very strong dollars, but Indonesia depreciation is uh, around 4.5% this year, which is relatively uh, actually mild or moderate comparing to many other countries. This is because of our performance on uh, external balance, on a ba balance of payment is actually quite good. The trade uh, account has been surplus for 27 months, so we have uh, more resiliency on the external side, but we do know that uh, the situation globally is not going to be easy. It's going to be much more complicated with the potential of increasing interest rate uh, by Federal Reserve, by ECB, which is going to be followed by the maybe recession in this case, and also keep very volatile, uncertain price of the, uh, the energy because of geopolitics. So we are going to be really prepared and go through the detail of the uh, uh, policy rather than tinkering only on the macro side. But the macro policy prudential framework still continue to be maintained will not be adequate. We have to go down into the detail to the regional, to the commodity, as well as to the source of the uh, price uh, pressure. As you said, you raised uh, subsidized fuel by about 30% just last week. Is it one and done? Might you be under pressure to raise prices further, given that um, expenses spending may be rising? Well, we are estimating for this uh, fiscal year, while at the same time this month, and that's why I cannot attend uh, this forum because we are still in the middle of discussion with the parliament regarding our uh, budget for next year. Uh, for this year, uh, this increase uh, of 30% of two commodities, that is solar as well as petalite, will be adequate to at least uh, compensating the increasing the fuel price, which is even above uh, $100 per barrel average for the first eight months. Now uh, we can see that uh, oil price slightly declined, but we are not really sure where, where this is going to go, uh, whether it's going to be uh, down into the 90s and continue there or going down again, or it's going to be like entering winter in which this has become one of the commodity uh, which is becoming very political globally. So it is not really sure where the oil globally is going to go, but uh, at this very moment, I think what we've already uh, taken a step uh, for adjusting the oil price uh, last week, I think will be adequate uh, to at least save the not only budget. First, I think the focus of our policy is try to maintain the momentum of recovery by protecting the people purchasing power. So the increase is not going to be extreme, but at the same time, we also make sure that our budget is going to be also safe and uh, credible and sustainable in the medium long run. So we are uh, aiming for these three very important objectives and uh, the decision which is being made last week, I think uh, serving those well that is uh, protecting still the people because we are still subsidizing. Second one, uh, also still maintaining the recovery of the economy, which is also very strong on the second quarter and will continue expected to be on the third quarter. And at the same time, also saving and creating a sustainability and credibility of our own budget because of the subsidy uh, burden is already uh, very extreme at this very moment. Bill, when we last spoke, you said that if there is a recession, it will be shallow. But since we last spoke, I mean, the data out of China has gone from bad to worse. The energy crisis in Europe, well, has deepened. Have we, I guess, misassessed the depth um, of the problems in China as well as Europe? Uh, yeah, that's, that is the big question of the day. And uh, I, I think the, 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 to continue your, your stream of news, I think the U.S. has probably been more resilient 
uh, than we might have thought in the face of the early phase of interest rate increases. Uh, the, uh, and I, I say that because of the, the ongoing strength in job growth. Now, on, the, on the one hand, that's a good sign for the US economy, which therefore for the global economy, of course, it will fuel inflation as well. Uh, so there's a, that, that's a double-edged sword, but, but the, the primary edge of that sort is, is a relatively resilient US economy. It, it, in my assessment, uh, and in the assessment of a lot of economists, probably uh, more than not, the US might avoid a recession. That's counter, counter to my initial view, which would that it would be very difficult. We'll see uh, just how high and how fast rates have to go. Uh, China, of course, has had a, a, a further stumble in, uh, in the second quarter and then into the third quarter on the back of ongoing lockdowns uh, and ongoing uh, problems in particular in the real estate sector. Uh, but the underlying dynamism of the Chinese economy remains quite strong. Uh, so I would uh, continue to hope that uh, when we get through this COVID period, uh, perhaps punctuated by the, the party Congress in, uh, in October, that we would see a return to, uh, to the kind of growth that could help to pull the, uh, the global economy out of recession. And of course, the, the most immediate impact would be right here. So yeah, as it's possible that we've misassessed and that it could be a little bit worse. It's, I think it's also possible that it could be a, a little bit less bad, let's say. Uh, I can tell you from, from Standard Charter's perspective, uh, that the focus that we're bringing to this is to continue to invest in our business globally, and in particular in this region, uh, with the view that the medium to long term is positive in any case, uh, even if we have some, some additional bumps along the road. But of course, we, we look and we watch and we reassess and, and, and uh, course correct as necessary. But, but broadly, I would say, uh, we think that the recovery, the post-COVID recovery is still on track. I'm just wondering because a Belgian minister said that um, the energy crisis in Europe could last for 10 winters, it'll be 10 difficult winters. So it could be longer than most of us are expecting. Yeah, like the energy crisis in Europe is tragic, absolutely tragic. And you know, I, I was in Germany before beating this trip. Uh, the air conditioning was turned off in my hotel in August with 38 degrees outside. And that's, those are the kinds of steps, and that's, that's not hardship. Uh, relative to what's happening in Ukraine right now, let's be clear. Uh, but that's, uh, you know, these are the actions, and that's the summertime. The wintertime, is, it's going to be very, very difficult. Europe will absolutely be in recession. Uh, Ten winters, I seriously doubt it. I, I think the, the resilience of supply chains that we've seen, apart from the energy sector, is, is quite strong. Uh, the, 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 the stakes for getting it right for energy producers around the world, so whether it's delivering the LNG terminals, readjusting, the, uh, the, the, the acceptability of, of nuclear power, uh, dare I say it, the acceptability of coal-fired power, uh, which, will, which will, I think, shave the peaks in the, in the short term. But will there be a dislocation in the European energy markets for 10 years? Yeah, of course, because there's 10 wasted years depending on Russian gas, which will, which will be seen with the benefit of hindsight as one of the geopolitical tragic mistakes of this decade, but it, it, or this millennium, possibly. Uh, but it's happened. And, and But yeah, we'll recover. Before we touch on the uh, opportunities in Southeast Asia, I'd just like to touch very quickly on the impact of the king dollar, the strong dollar, 20-year highs. When it comes to the ringgit, it is uh, at the lowest level since the Asian financial crisis, if I'm not wrong. Mm. Uh, Minister Zafarul, how are you ensuring stability of the ringgit mm -hmm. and stability of the financial sector? Well, the stability of financial sector in Malaysia, yeah, it's still there. I mean, we look at where we are on the, I think Central Bank has announced uh, the slightly tightening of our monetary policy. Uh, rates has gone up, as I mentioned just now, 25 basis points. So this year alone, it's gone up by 75 basis points. The, the plan is to, you know, from what the Central Bank has said, is to do increase gradually, right? Uh, because we do not want to, obviously there's a side effect uh, to increasing rates uh, too aggressively to the economy, right? And, and what we've seen is um, our economy is growing strongly. Um, and as I said, first half of the year is already 6.9%. So we can afford to increase the rate, rates. And on dollars, of course, um, as you said, uh, dollars has strengthened against all currencies. If you look at Malaysia ringgit, Malaysian ringgit is actually, you know, just like uh, uh, Indonesia rupiah, who's also done very well relative to other uh, currency. But if you compare it with dollars, of course not. So if you look at Malaysia ringgit, it's actually strengthened against uh, pound sterling, it's strengthened against euro, it's strengthened against Korean won. Jefferson. But the risk is to the downside. The Fed has moved 225 basis points, mm -hmm. but Bank Nagara has moved 75. The yeah. risk is that the currency will be under pressure. No, because you have to understand what is the inflation rate in US, right? So you don't, you don't have the monetary tools that are available in Malaysia 
or in other markets for that matter. Also depends on the economic scenario in that particular country. So as I mentioned earlier, the inflation rate is in Malaysia in the first six months or first seven months in this case is 2.8%. So we can continue to have a accommodative monetary policy and which is supported by a very, uh, very large fiscal support, right? Our uh, subsidy, for example, is the highest ever uh, at close to $20 billion. So that also has helped. So we, we through the um, application of uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy in Malaysia, we continue to support. But what's important is at the end of the day, the, the day is about the mid-term and long-term uh, prospect of the economy. So if the economy or the fundamental of the economy remains strong, we should not be too fixated just on the performance of our currency versus one particular We'll try currency. not to be fixated. Minister Srimulani, I mean, taking a look at the rupiah, inching ever closer to 15,000, Standard Chartered says 15,000 by the end of the third quarter. Do you think the level of the rupiah right now reflects its fundamentals? What's fair value? Well, Indonesia has the regime which is managed floating uh, in a way that it should reflect the fundamental. As I said, that we have 27 months surplus on a trade account, and our uh, reserve uh, also is actually uh, now uh, in a record high. We also see the FDIs coming to Indonesia despite uh, the very strong dollars. Of course, some like the bonds holder uh, of the government bonds, they are actually releasing the ownership, but uh, stock uh, isn't even in this case, stock is still actually receiving the capital inflow. And I also see just uh, recently that the demand for our government bonds is also increased on the FDI because we are reforming very uh, deep uh, structurally on the ease of doing business. We have passed the omnibus law for the job creation. We uh, strengthening and simplify the investment procedure. We also provide a strong uh, incentive for the downstreaming industries, especially natural resource base. Uh, so we also develop the electric vehicle as well as battery, and that is attracting uh, quite robust the FDI that support what we call it the external balance. So in a way, Indonesia can see that the dollar strengthened because of the policy of the Federal Reserve cannot be avoided, but we can increase our resiliency, which is not uh, vulnerable as vulnerable as when we have the taper tantrum in 2013 because of the current account, uh, which is now becoming surplus as well as trade account. And our budget is also very, very prudent. I'm going to the deficit of 2.85%, which is currently discussed for next year. This is a very fast and robust, credible budget consolidation only within three years. Uh, and that's providing a very strong fund foundation for the macroeconomic as well as our structural. Is there a need, you think, for Governor Wajio to, I guess, tighten further? Some say that perhaps we would need to tighten even before that September meeting. Well, first, uh, we have to look at, again, the anatomy of uh, the inflation. I think we are all agree, uh, government as well as central bank working hand in hand in order for us to be able to understand if the inflation is really coming from the supply side then the government working very closely regarding uh, what is the source of this uh, increasing price. If this is food or energy, then we have to find out how we are going to overcome that. That means that we are going to provide also room for the monetary authority to, of course, decide independently and credibly regarding where the position of their monetary policy. We don't want to use excessive, in this case, policy instrument like interest rate that can kill the whole monetary uh, uh, um, uh, recovery of the economy. But that is really up to the central bank to do that. And that's why they decide if this inflation is going to affect, the current inflation is going to affect the expectation of the inflation in a more permanent basis, then it is time for the central bank to act. So within that context, we will work so that we are going to use this policy as appropriate as possible without overkilling or creating what you call it unintended consequences rather than stability of the price itself. So we will look at very detail on the demand side, what is the factor, 
Bank Indonesia is using macroprudential uh, policy mix. It is not only interest rate, but they also using reserve uh, requirement. They also have the macroprudential. I think these are all going to match very uh, uh, hand in hand with the government own effort to try to stabilize price, especially which is coming from the supply disruption side. Bill, fundamentals in Southeast Asia seem intact. I mean, there's no doubt about that. When we talk about capitalizing on the opportunities and the strengths of the region, I mean, how is Standard Chartered positioning itself? Well, as, as Ben mentioned at the outset, uh, we, we start by having a, a, a very meaningful presence in every ASEAN country, uh, and in most cases for over a century. And uh, combine that with, with a strong business in, in greater China, so connecting through that, that critically important trade corridor, and then through to the US and Europe, uh, that other critically important uh, pair of trade corridors. So the, the way that we're, we're positioning ourselves, and of course, the, the ASEAN region is quite diverse itself and uh, disparate in terms of economic development, although the underlying growth story is, is quite impressive across uh, the region. So we have a, a, a good, strong local business on the ground. Uh, we have a, a strong business to focus on the, the, the really substantial flow of international investment into the region, uh, not least from China, uh, although of course it's not limited to China by any means, uh, and to uh, capture the, the external trading opportunities for, uh, for our, our corporate clients uh, who are local in the various ASEAN markets. And that, the, that, that uh, sort of circular approach uh, has stood us in very good stead so far, and I think we'll, we'll continue to. Uh, so it's, it's, for us, it's a matter of, of making sure that we've got the, the, the right resources on the ground and then the right connectivity to the rest of our network. Uh, to do that at, at a time of extraordinary volatility uh, it means that, of course, we need to have the, the, uh, the, the hedging and, and trading facilities in place and associated uh, credit facilities in place to, to help all of our clients to, to smooth through the ups and downs of uh, what we know is going to be a bumpy road ahead. But <clears throat> I, I, we didn't write this script uh, in terms of the, either the geopolitical or the global economic uh, outplay, but uh, I must say it, it, uh, it plays to all of our strengths, uh, not because we want to capitalize on, on the problems of the world, but, but, but we are in a position to help solve, or at least assist with some of those problems, and that's exactly what I and my colleagues have set about to do. As we talk about recovery and resilience, we have to talk about green transition. It is about mobilizing, uh, in that vein, mobilizing uh, private capital. Where, how do you see PPP playing out in this area? Well, it is important. I mean, partly to do with what we're seeing in the economy today as well. Um, but the, the, the key is for, for us in government, apart from fiscal intervention, what we can also do to assist is to ensure that the transition happens. Uh, um, we've seen how many uh, companies need assistance from the government uh, when they transition from uh, to, towards a more greener or towards more ESG uh, uh, compliance uh, business practices. So for Malaysia, what we're doing uh, today um, is obviously, uh, first, we need to ensure uh, that we have the right ecosystem in place, the right policy in place. So the policy uh, is being finalized. Uh, the, the relevant ministry will be announcing it. And through the financial markets, we are going to launch the voluntary capital market, for example, and that will be done by our stock exchange sometime by the for end of this year. Um, the, finally, I think on the fiscal incentives, uh, the government uh, working closely uh, with the industries because this is, requires a whole of nation, a whole of society approach uh, towards achieving where we want to achieve uh, by 2050. And mm. Minister Shimulani, of course, EV has a huge place in Indonesia. Indonesia has a huge EV ambition. Uh, um, and your president discussed that with my editor-in-chief just recently. I'm just wondering, I mean, what's the plan there? Because uh, that's a skills gap that needs to be addressed. There are other issues, not to mention investments that are needed for that to, to be realized. Well, first, uh, align with so many objectives that we would like to achieve. Climate change is for sure, and Indonesia is committed to reduce our CO2 uh, emission by 29% with our own effort and 41% with the international support. And that will require quite a lot of transition of our energy. Energy, in this case in Indonesia, which is still now dominated by the coal uh, energy, then we have to convert it into non uh, 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 to the renewable energy. Now, within that context, I think when we are discussing about uh, how we are going to use this uh, production of the electricity, one which we can see, especially now with the fossil fuel increase uh, very extremely, uh, then we also make sense 
for people to have the incentive fee for electric vehicle, whether this is uh, the um, uh, motor or uh, motorbike in this case, two wheel or four wheel. I think they are all equally important because uh, Indonesia two wheel EV is now getting more and more popular. Now uh, that's with Indonesia own in this case uh, market domestic, which is very, very strong. It will also attract quite a lot of what you call it FDI on this area, both on the electric vehicle as well as the battery uh, electric vehicle supply chains, which is I think equally very strong. If you talk about what is the ecosystem of this investment is already being prepared. First, we've already now uh, built so many, what you call it infrastructure, whether this is road, uh, railways, uh, port, which is all connected to the industrial area. So that definitely addressing the issue of whether we have the right infrastructure for actually attracting FDI. Second, you talk about the human capital. Of course, Indonesia now upgrading many of the vocational training. We are going to be very pragmatic so the industry can train directly. And I provide, in this case, fiscal incentive. They can even, in this case, claim their training uh, spending uh, double deduction for their uh, 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 their their spending for the tax that's also including for the research and development and indonesia have quite a lot of good university in which they are going to be able to produce this kind uh, of uh, labor force so i think what you're just saying that if we look at and diagnose thing, uh, diagnose the environment or the ecosystem of this investment, we recognize Indonesia is not yet everything is solved, but government systematically and consistently addressing all those issues. And after five years, President Jokowi now, or of course, interrupted by this pandemic, but I think we can see that the interest for investment in Indonesia, especially for the electric vehicle, as well as the battery is actually very, very strong. And it, this is also supported by our natural resources because Indonesia has the biggest nickel production in the world and all uh, other cobalt. So we actually have uh, an, uh, in a very good position to actually capitalizing this trend. When can we expect your nickel tax? <laughs> I know it is by this year, but uh, could it be maybe this month, next month? Well, the policy is more downstreaming uh, industry. So it is not about the tax, uh, how you are going to use, whether this is, uh, is going to be the excise uh, or the export duty, or in, in this case, uh, not allowing or disbanding export of nickel. These are all adjusted to the objective of developing industries, manufacturing industry, which is related to processing nickel, and at the very end is going to be the product on both vehicle, whether this is uh, two wheels or four wheels. As Bill mentioned earlier, I think I just uh, also know that European in a very difficult position now with the energy and others. So we are actually now become a very attractive place for you to invest because uh, market in ASEAN is very big, Indonesia, itself is also providing a very strong domestic market support. The reform uh, on our policy, investment policy and trade policy has been very progressive. We also simplifying so many uh, regulation and we also investing in infrastructure and human capital. So these are all the necessary condition for the investment uh, to happen in Indonesia. So as again, the policy related to the nickel, whether this is a tax, export, or industrialization, is going to be a one concerted effort in order to make Indonesia to be a place to invest. Bill, from a business perspective, what's stopping Southeast Asia from realizing its full potential? Uh, Southeast Asia, obviously, is a, it is a disparate region, and uh, I think one thing that, uh, that that I know the ASEAN nations are continuing to focus on is economic integration across the region. And uh, while we can all look at the, the, the ASEAN construct and see tremendous benefit to be had from uh, from from trading arrangements, currency arrangements, uh, it's not fully there. So uh, I would encourage further uh, further steps in that direction. I think creating a stronger regional markets, in, in particular, we, we, we were asking uh, the ministers before about the sustainability. 
uh, the, the sustainable finance market uh, in this region is huge. I, I would like to particularly praise uh, actually both ministers, but in particular Sri Liane during this uh, period where Indonesia is hosting the G20 uh, and the associated B20, there is some fantastic stuff going on. And there's a, a strong public-private partnership that, uh, that I think could set new, uh, new models for development. Uh, you know, let's roll those out first in ASEAN and, and, and see if we can't make ASEAN a, 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 a truly global hub for sustainable finance, for carbon markets, uh, for, for the way things can be done in the most constructive way. I think the foundations are being very well laid. So uh, always more to do, but I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to reflect on the progress that, that we've made with ASEAN over the past uh, years and decades to get us to this place. On that note, we'd like to thank, because it's time is already blinking red, <laughs> Minister Shimulani Dramati, thank you so much for your time today. Of course, uh, Minister Zafro and Bill Winters, thank you for your insights.